Thank you, Austin. And there go the kids. Always exciting moment. Can tell they love going to class. Looks like maybe a lot of us are back from the summer. It's good to see you all. Always good to look out and see loving, familiar faces. If you're new to Antioch, we welcome you. Love to have visitors. We do hope you kind of like it here because we kind of love it here. Um, as I begin to open up the word, I would invite you to take out something to maybe take some notes with. We try to come here with great expectation, not in the speaker, but in the word of God, that God will always say something that's worth remembering, worth writing down. So let's enter into this with faith. Today, we wrap up our summer series on the gospel of the kingdom. We spent 13 weeks highlighting the specifics of and in the kingdom of God things that are true only of the kingdom of God. And the coming of the kingdom is essential to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The kingdom of God stands in stark contrast to what we think and what we naturally feel. The kingdom, it guides us into doing what is not natural and what we often don't feel like doing. And yet, the promise of the kingdom is life. Not one of the lives, not a lifestyle, but life itself. That is the promise of the kingdom. Even in taking the entire summer to focus on the kingdom of God, I can tell you we have barely scratched the truths and the treasures that are in the kingdom and, and that the kingdom holds for us. But what we did cover is really, really important. And I'm going to encourage you as strongly as I can that you go back and listen to any messages that you missed. And in fact, that you revisit these kingdom messages from time to time. They're that important, not the messages themselves, but the kingdom of God is that important that we need to drop in and be encouraged and urge each other along in the kingdom of God. Today, we end our series by looking at the cross. There is no kingdom without the cross. Jesus coming inaugurated the kingdom of God. Jesus' incarnation brought the kingdom near, but it was the cross that proved that the kingdom was eternal. It is the cross that showed the people in every nation, in every generation, in every point of history that the kingdom has begun and the cross revealed the true king. And he's still the only king the only true king. He will always only be the true king. Very simply, there's no cross. There's no kingdom. But there was a cross. And there is the cross. And every generation has had to deal with the cross. Believing or not, every generation has to do business with the cross. There is no denying the cross and its power. Most certainly there are those who deny it. Throughout history, though, we have seen after story after story, generation after generation, that even those who don't believe are somehow impacted and have to deal with the cross. There's a famous story of three young boys that thought, it's a true story, of three young boys, teenage boys, that thought the whole church, the crucifixion of Christ, the confession of sins, all of it was a joke. So they determined that they would make up the most heinous things that they could come up with, but kind of believable, and that they would go confess them to the, church, to the pastor, to the priest. And so they did. And three of them went. And they did, and eventually the priest did actually catch on. They didn't fool him like they thought he did. And to the third one, he said to this boy, I'm going to give you a penance. I want you to go to that crucifix and I want you to kneel before it, and I want you to say out loud, this is your penance, Jesus, you did that for me, and I don't give a damn. And the boy thought it was part of the joke, and he was fine with that, and so he walked up, and he knelt at the cross, and he said it the first time, and then he said it the second time, but he couldn't say it the third time. Just the presence of the cross broke him down in tears. He was Jewish by heritage, he gave his life to Christ, and he became an archbishop in Paris. What is it about the cross? What is the power of the cross? Let me ask us all, 
I want you to answer this in your heads. Why the cross? What was accomplished on the cross? My bet is the answer in your head has something to do with the forgiveness of sins. And from there, that there will be some kind of attachment to the forgiveness of sins, meaning that we will ultimately go to heaven and be with God. Did your answer have something to do with that? I see some scared faces out there like you think I'm going to say, well, you're wrong. (laughs) You're not wrong. You're not at all wrong. Not at all wrong. In fact, I'll say to you that if anyone, no matter who they are, no matter where they are, begins to dismiss or minimize the forgiveness of sins that Jesus purchased on the cross, don't walk, run to the nearest exit. And, I don't know if you've gotten used to my ands yet, but and the cross and all that Jesus accomplished on the cross, it's even bigger than that. It's even bigger than that. I am aware that that statement may initially, and in fact throughout history, has at times caused offense. Because people somehow automatically assume that when you say there's more to it than just forgiveness, that it somehow minimizes the gift of forgiveness of sins. But can I challenge that? It's not true. If you remember, we at Antioch here, a lot of times, we identify our human nature that automatically assumes that when someone is getting more, when someone is getting a lot, when someone is receiving, it somehow means that someone else, mainly us, is receiving less. That the well isn't big enough. And so when I watch somebody else get the blessing from the Lord, I automatically start to have envy and some jealousy and think that it's minimizing what I can receive. It's not true. God has no limitations. And the principle here is even more so. That as we talk about the cross being more than just forgiveness... There's freedom on realizing the truth that you can celebrate everything, everyone else, and it doesn't remove anything from you. And like with the cross, we can talk about forgiveness and we can say there's more without taking anything away from the gift of the forgiveness of sins. It does not minimize forgiveness. I hope you're going to see it actually magnifies it. Forgiveness of sin was purchased and confirmed on the cross and is offered to all. Trying to fully describe the gift of forgiveness purchased through the cross is impossible. We can't even fully comprehend it, nor will we ever be able to describe it. We will spend the rest of our lives trying to fully understand the great gift that we have received in the forgiveness of our sins. And, and, praise our limitless God The cross is even bigger than just forgiveness of sin. It is my hope, my prayer that each of us today, each of us who love God, each of us who bathe in the gift of forgiveness, each of us who hold the cross as the highest moment of sacrificial and adoring love, and those of us in here who might be investigating the cross, that we will all walk out today more in awe of the cross, more grateful for the cross, more understanding of the power that was given to us and the light granted to us in the cross. And that we'll be okay and know for sure that it's bigger than just the forgiveness of our sins. That's the title of the message today. The gospel of the kingdom, it's even bigger than that. Will you stand with me for the reading of the scriptures, please? We're going to be in Luke 24. It's going to be up on the screen, so you can turn to your Bible, or you can follow along on the screen. And I am having trouble seeing this morning, so hopefully I can get through this blurry mess that's in front of me. 
And behold, it's a story of the road to Emmaus. A lot of us are familiar with this. And behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all the things which had taken place. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are these words that you are exchanging and, and, the, and one another, as one another as you are walking? And they stood still, looking sad. One of them, named Cleopas, answered and said to him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things that have happened here in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, The things about Jesus, the Nazarene. He was the prophet, mighty in deed and word, in the sight of God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death, and they crucified him. But we, are ho we were hoping that it was he who is going to redeem Israel. Indeed, indeed, besides all of this, it's the third day since these things happened, but also some women among us are, have amazed us when they were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. They came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who had said that he is alive. Some of those who were with us and went to the tomb and found it is just exactly as the woman also said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, oh, foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things, to enter into his glory? And then beginning with Moses, with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Let's pray together. Lord, as we enter into this passage and into the truths, we get to wonder together today, what did you talk about on the side of that road? When you said all the things, when you said the necessary things, what do we get to take from that? What power can we gain from it? How can we be lifted above circumstances and concerns and fears and into joy and confidence? by what you shared on the road that day. Grant us insights into your holy word by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Go ahead and be seated. Now I need to say a brief note before I continue. The cross and the resurrection, they're inseparable. But we're not gonna talk about the resurrection today, but I do want you to just think of this. Every time I say the cross, I want you to also hear confirmed by the resurrection because it's automatic, okay? So I'm not gonna talk about the resurrection today, but it's always confirmed by the resurrection. That's what makes it so special. So two of Jesus' disciples, obviously aware of the crucifixion, are confused and ultimately disillusioned enough that they are leaving. What they had given their life to, who they had given their life to, had been killed. And not just killed, but humiliated on the cross. The Romans did not invent the crucifixion, but they had perfected it. And these disciples would have seen men and women crucified. Sometimes after an insurrection, thousands were crucified on the side of the road and left on the cross. I won't go further. Left on the cross for all to see, and it had a message. This is what happens when you mess with Rome. Rome is the ruler of the world. Caesar is king. And see that? That's what happens to you if you try to disagree with that. The cross was a brutal tool, and it had a message. The two disciples in the stories would have seen brutal crucifixions, and the message was received by them. And they are confused and disheartened. They were done. They're leaving. Jesus meets them on the side of the road, but they don't know it's Jesus. Jesus asks them about the events, and they are shocked that this man does not know what has happened. Jesus listens to the whole description and then responds in verse 25. He said to them, oh, foolish men, slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. 
Was it not necessary for Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. I'm never ceased to be amazed when I read this story by two statements that always jump out at me. First is when Jesus says, was it not all necessary? That's just somehow really confirming to me. Nothing's out of control. No big surprises. Hey, and everything that happened according to plan, and all needed, all necessary. Somehow that encourages me. And then this beautiful event when he says, and he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Man, would that have been special, huh? Bible study with Jesus. Pretty darn cool. And it all pointed to the events of the last few days. That's what they were talking about. What did Jesus say to them? Which stories do you use? We don't know. But we do know that he invoked all the scriptures. And I am confident that in going through all the scriptures and the necessity of the cross, Jesus did speak about forgiveness of sins and of heaven. And I'm also very confident that he spoke about more than just forgiveness and more than about just heaven. That's what I want to share about today. I want to share some of the things that I believe all of the scriptures would have to have included that day. Why? Why do I want to share these things? Because of the result it had on the men. They were defeated, they were done, and they were leaving. They were leaving, they were done, and yet after Jesus finishes the Bible study, they excitedly turn around and go back on mission and head right back to Jerusalem. And Jerusalem was dangerous. Jerusalem could and maybe did cost them their lives and they would have known it. And yet empowered by the truths and the power of the cross, they excitedly headed back to Jerusalem. And I'm sharing today because our family is going through a Jerusalem season. And there just is no better time for me to talk about the cross. Than right now. And we too are finding that the power of the cross is meeting us everywhere along the journey. And I want to share because I'm sorry, but it's likely you too will have Jerusalem seasons. Hopefully not like ours, but you will have hard seasons. And you will need the fullness of the cross in those seasons. You will need all of the gifts and the power of the cross for your Jerusalem seasons. There are four biblical themes that were fulfilled and won on the cross, and you may want to write these down. And I'm going to tell you, we're going to go a little theological, and then I hope to bring the hay down where we can consume it, okay? So, four biblical themes, and I'm just suggest you want to write these down. The first one, forgiveness of sin. And next to that, I want you to write deliverance. The second one, exile and exodus. And next to that, I want you to write freedom of the captives. Third, tabernacle and temple. And next to that, I want you to write the presence of God. And last, the, the presence of evil. And next to that, you want to write victory over evil. I'm not going to teach or prove these themes today. You can ask Dr. John West to do that for you sometime. They're far too big, and we will be growing in our understanding of them for our whole lives, and we'll be enjoying the fullness of their gift for all eternity today. I just want to put them in our grids, 
I just want to plant them in our minds and our hearts and our souls so that as we continue our own study of the scriptures of God, these things planted on our hearts, minds, and souls will jump out at us. We will see them in the entire story of God and we will give, be given power by them. And they will empower our lives. And we'll grow in our understanding of appreciation, enjoyment, and the power that has been given to us by the cross. That's the goal. First theme, forgiveness of sin. Forgiveness of sin is the victory we most often refer to and are most familiar with. Forgiveness of our sins, one on the cross, results in our deliverance. As Jesus said to Paul on the road to Damascus, the forgiveness of sin delivers us from the domain of Satan into the domain of God. Forgiveness of sin delivers us into God's control, the rule and reign of God, and his forever protection. There are countless scriptures to affirm this truth of our deliverance in God's protection and care, but today we'll look at just one. It captures so much, it's a simple statement, but captures so much of the gift of forgiveness. Romans 5.1, it says this, Therefore, having been justified by faith, that's forgiveness, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Peace with God. We are delivered in the forgiveness of our sins into an eternal peace with God. The cross, all our sins, past, present, and future, were fully forgiven and were wonderfully, fully, and once and for all, we are delivered into the peace with God. And that's good news. Psalm 2 wonderfully unites the truth of our offenses of our sin to God and his merciful deliverance from us, for us, from our sins. Only he could deliver us from what we offended him with. And that's exactly what he does. Psalm 2.12 says it so beautifully. Wonderfully unites the true offense of our sin and God's merciful deliverance. Only he could deliver us. Psalm 2.12 says this. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Strong, hard, true. And then, blessed are you who take refuge in him. The beautiful truth that the very one we have offended is the one we must take refuge in. And who invites us to. Our sin is real, it is deep, it is costly, and it is beyond any of us to redeem. Except for the one who we're sinned against, only he can redeem it, and he does. The Holy One has every reason and justification to punish us and even destroy us. And instead, he says, come. Come, hide in me, take refuge in me, and I'll give you my peace. That's beautiful. I've never seen the marrying of God's holiness and his mercy more beautifully described than by A.W. Tozer. And he wrote this. We must hide our unholiness in the wounds of Christ. That's the cross. Just as Moses hid in the cleft of the rock as the glory of God passed by. We must take refuge from God in God. So cool. I don't run from him. I run to him. I don't hide from my offense from him. I take it to him. He doesn't punish me. He gives me peace. And he's the only one who can. Through the cross, we are delivered from our sins. Through the cross, we are delivered into God's peace and into God's refuge. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the cross. The second theme found all through the scriptures and perhaps not as widely understood and recognized as the forgiveness of sin is the theme of exile followed by exodus. 
You see, throughout the history of the people of God, God's people found themselves separated from God and enslaved to other kings, other cultures, other powers. There was Egypt, there was Babylon, there was Assyria, and now it was Rome. An ongoing cycle of separation and then a rescue of an exodus where God would deliver his people back into his care. Yes, freedom from sin, but also freedom from the world's mess, from the world's thinking, and from the world's oppression. The exodus was the freedom from all that the world had back into all that God has for us. And the day set aside for, the all, for all time to celebrate God's exodus, it was called the Passover. And it seems very likely that Jesus was very specific in choosing Passover in which he himself would be offered up. Which is interesting, because he could have chosen a feast called the Day of Atonement, which was all about forgiveness of sin, but he doesn't. He chooses Passover. Passover wasn't about forgiveness of sin. It was about the exodus. It was about the deliverance back into the presence of God, of God's people. The cross, it was the final exodus. It was God's guarantee that there will never be an exile ever again of God's people. You will never be separated by a culture, by a power, by a dominance. You can never be separated. And that was the final exodus. None will ever be needed because forevermore, the people of God will be with the presence of God. Never again separated. That again is really good to me. On the cross, exiles of every type, of any type, were ended. People were set free from every type of slavery. That's what the Exodus stood for. And on the cross, we are no longer slaves and will never be slaves again. Not slaves to an oppressor, not slaves to fear, never slaves again. We are children of the king. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross. The third theme, all through the scriptures and therefore likely covered by Jesus as he was walking with the disciples that day and leading them through all the scriptures, is the the theme of tabernacles of God and temples of God. The tabernacle traveled in the wilderness and was a place where God dwelled with his people, but the tabernacle was temporary. And then it was then replaced by the temple of God. But all through scriptures, it showed that the temple too was only temporary. Someday, someday a permanent temple would be established and there would be no more wondering about where God dwelled. There would be no more struggle with how to get in his presence. It would be secured by the cross. It would be eternal and inseparable for the people of God. And with the coming of Jesus, things change forever. John 1.14, it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt, that means tabernacled, among us. And we've seen his glory as of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. With the coming of Jesus had come the present among his people, come his presence among the people. And, and the scriptures taught that the day the temple would be established is permanent, a time when God's presence would never again leave his people because he would dwell inside of us. That too was accomplished on the cross. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross. Last theme fulfilled on the cross was the final and complete defeat of evil. Because of the struggles of the world, this one is often underestimated and misunderstood, and the victory is under-celebrated. John 3, but 1 John 3, it says, The one who practices sin is of the devil, and the devil has then the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus himself confirms that the, uh, the week coming up when he is talking about being offered up, he says, Evil's hour has come. He knew what it was up against. He knew he would face evil and he knew how this story would end. The victory was certain. It was definitive and it was complete and it was brutal. 
The battle was brutal. One of the biggest challenges I face, the questions I get asked in the unbelieving world is, why did the cross have to be so brutal? Brutal. Why would God do that to his son? God didn't do that to Jesus. That was evil and wickedness. Jesus was put on the cross and he called every evil, wickedness, everything that would suffer you and I, past, present, or future. He called out and said, come to the cross and do your worst. That's what he did on the cross. Every evil, everything that you, your children, your grandchildren would deal with, he called it to the cross and said, do your worst, and it did. That's why it was so brutal. And then Jesus said, but evil's hour has come. Because when that hour was done, then it was Jesus' turn. In Colossians 2.15, says this, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us in the, in the legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Jesus had laid himself to every pain, every sorrow, every struggle that we would face, took evil's worst and then said, my turn. And it's still his turn. And it will always be his turn. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross. Because of the cross, we are victorious. I hope these truths about the power of the cross are encouraging to you. I hope you will hold them in your hearts and your minds and your souls and that you'll listen for them as you go through your own journey with the scriptures and you'll find their beauty and their power. I hope now going forward in this message that this last part is to give us a picture of what the cross can look like when it does intersect with our lives when it does step up to our trials. When it comes against our sorrows, many of you know the battle of our daughter, which is now public in our family, that we and our family are in particularly with a particularly cruel disease. In order for me to share about the rescue of the cross, I have to share a little bit of the details of the ugliness of this disease. Our daughter Anna is 32 years old and has battled anorexia for 18 years. Anorexia is a particularly cruel disease in that it creates a crippling, tormenting fear of the very things that support life, food and water. Food and water torments the soul. Anna has had ongoing hospitalizations and six to seven attempts at some kind of inpatient treatment, followed by at least 14, what are called intensive outpatient teams, therapists, doctors, nutritionists, countless coaches. Nothing has worked. Nothing has even come close to working. We haven't dented the disease in 18 years. That's how evil it is. Three years ago, Anna was so sick that she needed to be airlifted to Denver to the only facility in the country that could save her. And after six weeks of recovery there in that hospital, then she sent six months in a facility, yet another facility inpatient in Tennessee. Lest you think that we only tried the medical approach, Anna has tried every kind of prayer. She has gone on picnics with Jesus that would try and help her eat. And she went through discipleship school and deliverance ministries, and there have been years and years of fasting, prayer, and faith for healing. The journey with anorexia for the one suffering and for the family, it's different than cancer. And I don't say this with bitterness, but it's different than cancer. It's different than liver disease. It's different than kidney disease because the answer is right there in the refrigerator, for goodness sake. There's so much confusion around it. 
It has a will component, a spiritual component, a mental health component. And because the answer is right there in the kitchen, the disease comes with so many confusions. And I don't say this with bitterness, so many judgments. And to be honest with you, less compassion. Because it's just so confusing. The suffering and sacrifice for our family and our other kids has been deep, constant, and long. Try to imagine building a relationship, any kind of a relationship, that doesn't involve food or drink. You can't. And this disease destroyed every relationship Anna had, almost every relationship that she had. And I say that without judgment. It's just not a disease you can be around for very long. Anorexia is actually given a personal name, Ed. That's what the treatment world calls the horrendous disease, but you and I know it's the real name and who it is. It is the presence of evil, incarnate, incarnate. There are manifestations of anorexia that are terminal. Worship team, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to come up as I close. There are manifestations of anorexia that are terminal, although the mental health world is not as quick as other medical fields to admit when they have no further effective treatments. Anna has the, that particular manifestation and Anna's disease is terminal. And this past week, and in particular these past days, have confirmed that the end is very close. So why would I preach? I hope you'll find out. By the end of this, Anna turned once again for the worst to the worst just over a year ago. And after her team recognized she needed hospitalization, once again, Anna and I met and she informed me that she could never go back to treatment. And when I asked her why, she said, because it won't work. And she's right. It won't work. It does not work. I knew it was true. And so we set on a path to give Anna every chance to fight the disease at home among the people she loved and the home that she loved and the cats that she loved and the life that she loved. There's much more I could tell you about the story, but this actually isn't about Anna. It's not about our family. It's not even about anorexia. It's about the cross. And I want to share how the four truths of the cross that I just shared have intersected with Anna and her family. A couple of months ago, I be, it became obvious that Anna was losing her battle. Lynn and I called her to ask if we could come over, and she said, no, I can't be seen by anyone right now. And then this conversation that lasted about an hour, Dad, am I going to die? And the honest answers that followed. And I want you to know the terror and the fear that followed over the phone that uh, on the other side. And what cried out of my daughter's mouth was not about death, it was about the shame, the guilt, the loneliness, and the failure that she felt in her life. And she said, dying to this will be my final failure. And God led me to an answer. He spoke, we were praying, and I said, no, honey, it's your victory. How, Dad? How can it be victory? Because it'll be the first time you've chosen over your disease in 18 years. This doesn't want the peace of death for you. This wants torment and torture for the rest of your life. And then I started reading scriptures over her. I didn't have my Bible. We we're in the dark and we we're just were citing scriptures over her for almost 20 minutes. And it, the phone went silent and I didn't even know if she was there. I didn't know if she would say, Dad, not now. And all of a sudden I said to her, honey, what is your heart telling you? And she said, that it's time that I surrender. And then she said, would you and mom come over and tuck me in? What I'm trying to describe for you is the evil that was faced for 18 years that we couldn't even dent got silenced in a second by the cross. And the peace that she found that night has never left her. She's still walking in that peace. 
The terror and the anger and the shame are gone. I can't even take the time to tell you all that has been redeemed in my daughter's life in the last several months. But it is complete. It is complete. You see, the cross rushed in and redeemed what we couldn't touch for 18 years. Because of the cross, Anna has been delivered by forgiveness and she walks in the peace of heaven and knowing her rescue and when we go on our walks, she doesn't ask if she's going to heaven. She asks, what will it be like, Dad? What will God and I talk about my life since I've been sick so long? It's sad, but it's beautiful. Because of the cross, Anna has experienced her exodus. She was set free. And she's walking in that freedom all the way to the end. No longer considered a failure. Her legacy is as a warrior and brave and a hero. She's no longer an exile. No longer a slave. The cross set her free. Because of the cross, Anna is a temple of God and is enjoying the unending comfort of the presence of God. Just a few days ago, I took her for a ride on one of her favorite things with the tops off in the Jeep, and she looked over and said, God is being so kind to me. That's the cross. I have no explanation for that. A 32-year-old is going to die, and she says, God is being so kind to me. Because of Anna's cross, Anna finally has victory. <laughs> the most evil thing I've ever seen has been put at bay until God ushers her into her final peace. <laughs> I've shared with you that 18 years ago, the day I first realized that the disease might take out our Anna. <laughs> I shared, I got down on the floor and I wept and I asked God. And God said to me, I'll be enough for her, for you and for your family, whether she lives or whether she dies. And I didn't know what it meant. I knew it felt good. I knew it was true, but I didn't know what it meant. What did that mean? And now I know. He was saying the cross will be enough. And it has been. And the reason I decided to go ahead and preach today is there's no better time for me to tell you about the cross. There's no better time. There's no better way for me to tell you it's enough. And it will be enough for you. That's the beauty of the cross, that is the power of the cross. Yes, to forgive sin, but it's bigger than that. And that's really good news. It's the best news. Will you stand with me? Lord, as we close in prayer and our prayer team comes forward, this feels like a thank you moment more than anything else. It just feels like a thank you moment, Lord, that I hope that somehow, not because you want so much to feel our gratitude right now, but that you want to give us peace right now. I pray that anything that we're carrying, any fear, any concern, any anger, any resentment, anything that's holding us captive, that will come forward and will come to the foot of the cross and we'll say thank you Jesus for the cross and we have faith in its power to heal. Amen.